Japan began her Pacific War on 7th December 1941 with a surprise six-carrier strike on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, damaging or sinking all eight U.S. Pacific Fleet battleships moored up in battleship row in the harbour. Japan already had control of many former German-held Pacific atolls, such as Truk and Palau, seized during World War I. But now, in the first days of the Pacific War, the Philippines fell to Japan, along with Hong Kong, Malaya, Singapore, Guam, the Dutch East Indies and large parts of New Guinea. By November 1943, the Japanese Empire was vast, as shown grey on this chart. But the Allies were able to halt the Japanese expansion at the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942, shown at the bottom of this chart, and then at the Battle of Midway a few months later in June 1942, shown at the top of the chart. From that point onwards, in the summer of 1942, Japan gave up dreams of further expansion and sought to hold on to her conquests. In November 1943, the Allies began their Central Pacific Drive. US forces invaded and seized the Gilbert Islands of Tarawa and Macon before seizing strategic Marshall Islands such as Kwajalein and Majuro in January 1944. On 17th and 18th February 1944, in Operation Hailstone, the great Japanese naval and air base of Truk in the Caroline Islands was smashed and neutralised by nine carriers of Task Force 58, carrying some 600 strike aircraft. Around 40 Japanese ships were sunk and hundreds, hundreds of planes destroyed. Many Japanese warships and transport ships retired some 1,200 miles west from Truk to the perceived safety of, of the great Japanese naval base of Palau. But just six weeks later, in a copy of the two-day truck raid, 11 carriers of Task Force 58 arrived about 100 miles off Palau. And in darkness at 0430 on 30th March 1944, 72 Grumman F6F Hellcat fighters launched for an initial fighter sweep of the atoll to knock out Japanese fighters and establish air superiority. After an hour of flight, they swept over Palau, catching and destroying many Japanese fighters on the ground and knocking down those found aloft. Although the Mitsubishi A6M Zero fighter had been untouchable at the beginning of the war, it was now no match for the new F6F Hellcat. Now, with undisputed control of the skies, over the two days of Operation Desecrate 1, successive waves of dive bombers and torpedo bombers, escorted by F6F Hellcat fighters, swept over the Palauan Lagoon, sinking some 20 Japanese ships. The large 15,450 tonne oiler Iro had been built in the 1920s, an oiler is simply a tanker that's equipped for a beam refuelling of other ships uh, at sea whilst underway. She could make 14 knots and could carry 8,000 tonnes of oil. The Eero was hit by a torpedo from an American submarine on 22nd March 1944 whilst en route for Palau in convoy. She was hit at the bottom of her bow. Her hull was blown open but the damage was well forward of her watertight collision bulkhead and she was able to limp to, to Palau for repair entering Palau's western lagoon at dusk on 23rd March 1944. On the first day of Operation Desecrate 1, dive bombers from the fast carrier Bunker Hill attacked her and scored one hit, but she was able to remain afloat through the rest of the day and into the night. On day two of the fast carrier strike, she was hit by a 1,000 pound bomb on the starboard quarter aft, just above the waterline. The delayed fuse bomb went straight through her shell plating before detonating inside in her engine room, starting a fire. Clouds of black smoke billowed upwards. In this American combat photograph, the Eero is the large vessel in the centre bottom of the shot, billowing large clouds of black smoke. You can just make out that there's been a near-miss bomb off her starboard side. Um, looks like a, a Grumman F6F Hellcat flying in from the left of shot. Just above the Eero, uh, there's another vessel billowing clouds of white steam and smoke. That's uh, the Eero's sister oiler, Sata. The great oiler flooded by the stern, which grounded in the bottom of the harbour. Her bow rose high out of the water, her steel decks red hot from the fires that had swept her. In this combat photograph, you can see the anchor chain under tension from her bow. Uh, and she's uh, surrounded by a slick of fuel oil from our tanks. All the dots in the water are just uh, empty 55 gallon drums of oil. Today, the wreck of the Eero is perhaps Palau's most famous shipwreck. 
She's a large, substantially intact vessel sitting upright in just over 40 metres of water. At her bow, her anchor chain still snakes out across the seabed, just beside the hole in her stem made by the torpedo from the American submarine USS Tunney. Uh, on top of the forecastle deck, uh, her bow gun is still present. On her foredeck, she's got her tall RAS masts, that's the refuelling or replenishment at sea mast. The Eero is what's called a three island vessel, in that uh, there are only three islands above the main weather deck. The flying bridge is an aerial walkway that connects all these three islands and it runs down the port side of the ship, about eight feet above the deck. Between the RAS masts uh, on the foredeck and the forecastle is a large square hatch for her dry cargo hold, where she would carry things like 55 gallon drums of, of fuel. Between the RAS masts and the bridge superstructure are the small rectangular or square hatches for her individual fuel tanks below in the body of the ship. It's a long swim from the bridge superstructure to the stern superstructure. Uh, you will pass the aft king posts uh, and also on the deck you'll see lots of these small uh, fuel tank hatches. The stern superstructure or stern castle is particularly interesting. You've got the boiler room forward where the large banded smokestack has collapsed and fallen to port to project out over the side of the ship. On the port side aft you'll see a tall tripod. That's a refueling tripod that was used to support the heavy duty hoses that would pass from her pumps across to whatever vessel she was refueling alongside. There's a large stern gun on a substantial platform at the very stern. Dropping over the fan tail and going underneath, the rudder is almost completely buried and the prop is still on the ship, but it's buried deep into the silt of the seabed. A full description of the wreck of the Eero can be found in my book, Dai Palau, The Shipwrecks. So we'll go for a dive on the, the wreck of the Eero now. Uh, the dive starts at the very bow, where we'll just drop straight down the stem to see the damage caused by the torpedo uh, on the hull. And here it is, I've just got down to the bottom at about 35-40 metres, and I'm looking just at the very front of the ship, the very bow. And you can see how the, the plating's all rippled and been blown apart by the torpedo explosion. What's noticeable is that the very stem itself, uh, the front of the, the ship, is actually detached from the keel of the ship here. So uh, it was quite a catastrophic uh, torpedo impact. Hanging down, just in front of the camera now, is the starboard anchor chain. Here's another view of the starboard anchor chain with the stem of the ship just to the, to the right. So I'm just going to rise up the stem now uh, and get onto the forecastle deck. So this is me just arriving at the top of the uh, bow and coming onto the forecastle deck. And you can see in the distance her gun platform for 140mm or 5.5 inch defensive gun used against submarines that might approach her on the surface or other vessels. So I'm starting to move aft from the forecastle deck and you can see now the large square hatch for her forward dry cargo hold. And just off to the right we can see the RAS masts, our tall foredeck masts. Dropping into this uh, dry cargo hatch uh, this is the tween deck level, uh, the first level down from the, the weather deck. These uh, are electric cables, heavy duty World War II era electric cables that have just fallen from their mounts on the, the roof of the tween deck. So I'm just moving underneath the overhanging uh, deck here into a bit of darkness uh, and that's looking forward towards the bow of the ship uh, and you can see there's a large door that's uh, partially open just there uh, leading into the forecastle. 
uh, and then just over towards the port side of the ship there's another large uh, door which is open into the forecastle but you can see it's a large build up of silt uh, block billowing out from inside the forecastle. Here's some more uh, light cables just hanging about. So I'm just going to drop deeper into this dry cargo hold. It goes down through three levels. And at the very bottom it's really quite dark and black um, and there's not a lot of light gets in down here. There's quite a volume of hoses and cables and fitments down here at the very bottom and I guess that this was all used uh, in connection with the refueling operations uh, with the RAS masts just in the foredeck uh, just slightly aft of where I am just now. So I've now dropped down to the very bottom of this hold. Uh, you can actually see the keel frames of the ship running across. And in between the frames, there are uh, crates of beer or sake uh, bottles. Something that you find in most Japanese uh, ships, both in truck and palau. Um, most of the Japanese sailors and the soldiers ashore were given one or two bottles of beer a day just to ease the, the rigors of life in the tropics, I guess. So here's a crate of bottles. The bottles are all still neatly stacked upright, but the, the crate that they would have been in might have been wood and it's just rotted away. There's another crate of bottles just sticking up through the silk. So I'm just going to follow this ladder back up from the very bottom of the hold and come out again through this hatch onto the foredeck. So what we're looking at now is the flying bridge. This is the aerial walkway running down the port side of the ship. You can see it just behind the tall RAS masts on the foredeck running from the forecastle to the bridge and then running from the bridge to the stern superstructure. So we're now uh, beside the RAS masts and way up there in the distance on the surface you can just make out the outline of the dive vessel that we were uh, diving from on this day. The RAS masts are still perfectly upright and intact. So I'm just going to swim down the starboard side of the of the deck, past the frass mast. moving past the Rasmus on the starboard side of the weather deck and moving towards the bridge which is just down there in the distance out of sight at the moment. It's quite a big ship so there's quite big distances you have to swim. So I'm just spinning round mm. now uh, to look at the Rasmus and the distant surface and here on the starboard side we've got uh, the jumbo boom which would have been lashed to the Rasmus uh, at one point but it's obviously fallen over uh, as the ship sunk, uh, she must have listed to port because it swung over to port and now rests on top of the flying bridge. And that jumbo boom would have been used to load cargoes in and out of that dry cargo hold that I've just been in. Here we're just looking at the small individual hatches for the oil tanks deep below in the, the ship and just continuing to move slowly aft over these hatches. So one, two, one, two, three, one, one, two. 
So continuing to move further aft, the bridge is now uh, appearing out of the uh, gloom in the distance. So only rises up a, a few levels and it looks skeletal because I think much of the frontage of the bridge would have been wood panelling and that's just rotted or been burnt away uh, during the war. So we've now passed the bridge superstructure just on the right of this image and we're starting to move across the main weather deck towards the stern superstructure which has the boiler room, engine room and the defensive gun. On the port side of the weather deck here you can see the flying bridge connecting the bridge superstructure to the stern superstructure. As we get nearer towards the stern uh, we find that the uh, flying bridge is actually melted and collapsed uh, as a result of the intense heat from the fires that... Oh no, I think... No, it's not like flat. But this is okay here. It's a flying thing. So we've got a pair of lifeboat davits here in the swung out position. It looks like these, this boat was actually launched as she was sinking. I'm just swimming in from the port gunnel over the flying bridge walkway running down the port side of the ship and I'm moving towards the centre of the deck where you can see there's a number of these small uh, oil tank hatches. So older tankers would have as many as 33 of these individual oil tanks and each one had its own inspection hatch or access hatch so it could actually be physically checked as they were filling and uh, pumping the oil out of the tank. Turn around to look aft now, towards the aft king posts. These king posts, and indeed the rasmas on the foredeck, all had ventilators at the very top of them, so that there were uh, breathers coming from the various oil tanks, which uh, ran up these uh, king posts and, and the rasmas posts to the very top, so that any inflammable gases that were uh, expelled from the tanks and as the tanks expanded or contracted could be vented uh, high above the ship and well away from any sources of ignition. And as with the RAS masts on the foredeck there's a heavy duty jumbo boom here on the main aft king post and it's resting its end actually on the, the deck. It's fallen to the, to the deck again presumably as the, the ship sunk. I'm diving here with Gary Petrie uh, and he just pointed out to me that the flying bridge on the port side running between the midships superstructure and the stern superstructure has actually collapsed down um, as it meets the stern castle and by looking at it, it became clear that the very structure ha itself had gone, almost as though it had melted during the fires which were started in the engine room by the, the bomb. Stern Castle. So we're just arriving now at the Stern Castle itself. You can see there are steps lead up from the main weather deck to the upper deck. And also there's an open door into the spaces below, which is actually takes you towards the engine room. <laughs> up at top, uh, surrounded where the smokestack would have risen, there are four four-strap ventilators designed to 
funnel fresh air down into the hot spaces of the engine room and boiler room. There's a large open rectangular aperture here where engine room fitments would have been lowered in and removed. On the port side aft, uh, on top of this third superstructure, is the tall tripod that would have been used to support refueling hoses that would take the fuel from the Eero across to whatever ship she was refueling alongside. Just nearby is the collapsed smokestack that is really big. The smokestack projects out to the port over the side of the ship, right out over the gunnels of the ship, and it's got a ladder running up the uh, front of it. In the distance, just after the collapsed smokestack, you can see the tripod still standing up on the port side of the ship. And it might help if I just zoom in here so you get an idea. You can see the smokestack on top of the boiler room and then the refueling tripod just uh, aft of it. The lifeboat davits uh, on this stern superstructure are in the swung in position so it looks as though the lifeboats weren't launched from here because of the fires. Now at the very stern is the 5.5 inch or 140 millimeter defensive stern gun on this wide circular now skeletal platform uh, and that's pointing directly out over the stern uh, and that's the rounded sweep of the fan tail that I'm looking at. Although the visibility is quite good in this particular day here, it's at least 20, 30, 40 metres, there seems to be a haze down below towards the seabed, and the seabed's actually out of sight. It's quite a common feature in diving Palau wrecks that you get good vis on the wrecks themselves, but lower down towards the seabed, uh, it becomes quite silty and, and granular, and the vis really drops down. And I think it's just a form of groundswell currents stirring up the silty seabed around the substruction that is the, the shipwreck. So this is just looking up the, the ship from the very stern and you can see the refueling tripod on the port side of the ship just ahead of us here. Now I'm just thinning, pushing myself away from the, the very fan tail of the ship. Um, it's quite got quite a distinct and pronounced schooner stern. Sweeps away quite dramatically underneath the ship itself. So I'm just going to pop down and have a look and see uh, the rudder and see if the prop is visible. So despite the silt, it's quite clear that the rudder is deeply buried in the silt and that the prop is way below the level of the seabed. You can't see there! Can you see? This is off the now we've left the seabed and just popped back up onto the uh, weather deck at the very stern where the defensive gun platform is established. You can see the skeletal framework of it, large, circular. So we've got the barrel off the left, the breech off to the right, and the splinter shield to protect the gun crew in the middle. So I'm just swimming around towards the breech. These uh, stern guns were used to fire on, for example, <laughs> submarines that might approach on the surface. 
Uh, it was a very stable platform with a tanker and this 5.5 inch gun would probably outgun and be more accurate than the uh, smaller gun on a submarine that was pitching yeah. and rolling about in the surface. And all the time the oiler could use its fine speed to escape from the submarine. Now we're starting to move back forward from the very stern and just in front of the gun is the opening to let you get into the engine room. Now the engine room is quite a mess of mangled steel uh, and that's because the bomb came in the starboard uh, side of the ship and actually exploded in the engine room and did an awful lot of damage and started a fire which weakened all the structures. So you can see the steps leading up there to a doorway uh, out forward from the engine room. And this engine room goes down several deck levels, uh, essentially to beneath the level of the seabed outside. So this has caught my attention here. I'm just moving into this uh, compartment. Um, and you can see there's a gash in the shell plating of the, the ship. Uh, there's a porthole above, circular porthole, and then there's a gash in the, the side of the ship. Uh, so I'm wondering already if this is the entry wound for the the bomb that uh, came in because of the delayed fuse bombs the bomb would have just punched in through the shell plating of the ship and then exploded inside. I'm just getting myself sorted out checking there's no impediments to snag me on the, the roof uh, and then I'm going to get my torch sorted out for the right correct setting and then we're just going to move into this room and have a look at this uh, wood. So looking at the shell plating here of the, the hull, you can clearly see that it's actually punched in, bent in towards the inner side of the ship. So it's definitely something's come through the hull there. So I'm just doing a, a form of helicopter hover turn here, just as my fins to gently spin me round and avoid stirring up the silt. Uh, that's the last thing you want to do inside a ship bed. Back out of the engine room and moving a little bit uh, further forward uh, comes to the smokestack fallen to the port side of the ship. I'm just spinning up on top of the smokestack and moving along it. Uh, you can see these bands that um, go around the smokestack. arriving at the bottom of the smokestack, uh, which you can see is surrounded by four uh, upright four strap ventilators to bring mm -hmm. fresh air down to the boiler room. Okay. Yeah. Here, Gary! Here! Ooh. Here! Where are you? Uh, here! Uh. Where? Where? Mm. <laughs> you see a smoke stack? It's a funnel! It's a funnel! It's a funnel! Fuck it, see! Yeah. 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 So moving forward from the smokestack, we arrive at the main king post on the weather deck aft of the bridge. 
that's looking out towards the starboard side of the ship, the starboard gunnel, with the lifeboat davit in the swung in position. So that's basically about it. I hope you've enjoyed this wee tour of uh, one of the greatest shipwrecks in the world, uh, one of my personal favourites, the Euler Eero in Palau. Until next time.